Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Welcome to part four of Kamido and Baba. Hope you guys are enjoying it. Uh, if you guys have any questions for me to ask, you can comment, I guess. So, yeah, just enjoy another part of Mido and Baba. And, yeah, thanks. Okay, beautiful. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ready to go? Okay. I think so. Alright. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So, do you have, do you have a question, Mido? Prepared or anywhere? Not one prepared. Anything? I don't know, I'll think of something. Baba wanted to cover a few things. Okay, Bismillah. First, um, you know, let's talk about, first, let's talk about why lying is a major sin. Okay. Because God says in the Quran that God doesn't like lying, and that lying is <coughs> a big sin. And you know, a lot of people always wonder, like, what's well, what's wrong with lying? What's wrong with just not saying the truth if it helps me out? Like, if it makes me, it gives me an advantage. Yeah. But the problem with lying. And the reason that it's such a big deal is that think of think of any relationship you have with anyone in the world and all the relationships that people have are based on a level of trust. So like you know, you found yourself born in this world, you have parents, right? Yeah. How do you know that tonight you're going to be fed and you're not going to sleep in the street? I guess I don't. Well, there's an Im Im implied trust relationship. You, the yeah. implication is, right, is that because you have your parents, these are your parents, and you simply have trust that your parents are going to take care of you, that your parents are going to feed you, that your parents are going to give you a place to sleep. And that trust is what we call bond of relationships. It's, it's the bond that allows you to feel safe and secure and to know what's going to happen tomorrow or what's going to happen after tomorrow. Without it, you would be full of anxiety and fear because you, then you can't trust anything. And that so that trust is so critical because it, it allows for marriages, it allows for relationships of being a child to your parents or being parents to a child or being friends or and if that if people can't count on that trust so much falls apart. Not just in families, but friendships, even in politics. Like, if you can't trust that your your leaders in government are going to be honest with you, then you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You know, they might tell you, you can't trust that you're going to receive your salary. You can't trust that you're going to have your job. You can't trust that you that this is your home and it's going to stay your home because if people are basically feel free to fake each other, they feel free to trick each other, then what happens is that human beings become full of anxiety and fear. And when human beings are full of anxiety and fear, it brings out the worst of them. Yeah. Oh, do you know the term being fake? No. No? Okay, well, it's more used now. But it's like when people kind of have a persona and they make friends off of that persona. Well, I mean, that's acting. sort of like, yeah, that's sort of like being full of lies. Yeah. And, and anything that is full of lies creates anxiety and fear. 
and it creates, you know, um, a sense of insecurity. Yeah. And so lying, you know, in the short term, it could give one person an advantage. But in the long term, it destroys everything because it destroys the relationship of trust. Yeah. And that's why God basically makes it so important that we are truthful. Because if we're truthful, you know, marriages exist, friendships exist, relationships exist. Human beings can't interact with each other if these relationships are built on a principle that lying is okay. Yeah. What allows for relationships to exist is the principle that it's sort of like you need to trust that people are, taught, are being truthful. And the most important thing is the truth, being truthful, is a habit. And lying is a habit. Yeah. It's like if you lie once, the second time it's easier, the, th the third time it's even easier to lie, the fourth time it's e it gets easier and easier. And then you get into the habit of lying. And can you imagine if everyone around you got into the habit of lying? Yeah. It would destroy everything. And that's why lying is such a big sin. It's so important that we say the truth, even if the truth in the short term will cause us embarrassment or discomfort or make us lose an advantage because in the long term, one, we get used to being truthful human beings, but two, we build trust. You know, in when people get used to say, well, yeah, you know, Nido is a truthful person. That gives you, like you build a credit of trust and building that credit is what allows for relationships to exist. And also, the, you know, the last thing I'll tell you is that um, when, you, when a person lies to another, one of the most important thing is to learn to be truthful to yourself. Because if you lie to other people, the first person you lie to is yourself. And the more you lie to other people, the more you lie to yourself. And then there are so many people that they lie to themselves so often because they lie to others so often yeah. that they no longer will know what the truth is. And that's a horrible state to be in because then you're like a fake human being. You know, you're no longer real. You're just fake. Yeah. And... And the same thing, you know, also with God. It's like if you lie to other people and you lie to yourself, you also lie to God. And it's it's ironic because, you know, God knows the truth anyway. But there are so many people that just get into the habit. They lie to God others, they lie to themselves, they lie to God. And, you know, it's amazing because in the long term, all of us respect truthful human beings yeah. and all of us and admire a truthful human being and all of us lose respect for a lying person someone who constantly lies yeah so you know the topic of lying is is really important it, it's it's amazing like how easily we we think that it's okay to tweak the truth, it's okay to not say the truth, but what we end up doing, we end up destroying trust. What about like, uh, what's the term, white lies? Well, the one, as I said, you know, like saying the truth is a habit. So the most important thing is that you always remember that I, you know, I don't want to get into the habit of not saying the truth. Now there are lies that where you basically 
avoid hurting someone's feelings, but not for your own benefit. And that's, I think, one of the biggest differences. It's like, you know, someone comes to me and says, oh, listen to me play the, you know, an instrument. And isn't, did I do good? And, you know, maybe they didn't do good. Maybe they weren't that great. But you say, you know, good job. Now, here you're not, you're not hurting this person. You're actually encouraging this person. But also, very importantly, you're not gaining an advantage. And that's really one of the biggest things is that if, you know, it's not, it, lying is, is really where you bre break a trust. But when you tell someone, um, oh, you know, yeah, good job, you're not breaking a trust. You know, you're, you're, you're not... You're not, you're not being fake either. It, it's, you want to encourage that person. So white lies, you know, they're tricky because you, you have to make sure that you're not manipulating the truth to give it to yourself an advantage. And you need to also think, is it really a lie or am I just encouraging someone or supporting someone? Because supporting someone or encouraging someone is not a lie, you know? You're sincere about your support. You're sincere about wanting to encourage another person. Yeah. I don't know. It's just weird to me because in that like analogy, I guess, you used for the instrument thing, I think I'd rather be told like if I did bad, that you did bad and you should do better. Is it kind of like a moral decision? If you should do that white lie, or if you should just be yeah. honest. I mean, it's the, the the situation is always whether you're gonna hurt someone or not. So if you're not like if I am, so if my relationship with someone is that they expect me to give them feedback on their playing, yeah, then yeah, I have an obligation to be truthful because the relationship is one of trust. I trust you to give me honest feedback on my playing. But if it's not a, a situation where there's expectation of trust, but rather just, you know, I want people to, to not um, break my confidence, not destroy my self-confidence, or I just will don't, you know. So I think it's always whether there's the expectation of trust or not. So, yeah. you know, of course, you, you have, like, you could have people in, in your band, right? Uh, do, is when they, when you give feedback on their playing, is there the expectation of trust? Are you breaking their trust if you don't give them honest feedback? Or is it just a matter of being encouraging? Yeah. And so, it's all, that's really the key thing for lying, is that are you breaking someone's trust? When is someone, like, you know, are your parents trusting you to tell them the truth? Is your friend trusting you to tell them the truth? Is your teacher trusting you to tell, you, tell them the truth? Yeah. If there's that trust, then you have to honor it. Because without trust, we don't have anything. Everything falls apart. Yeah. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is... Is there like, I don't know, this isn't really related to God, but like building trust, right? Is it mainly just, I don't know what I'm trying to say here. Like what's the fastest way to build trust? And like, or here, yeah, let me change the question. Is, hmm, wait, okay. So, say you break a relationship of trust, right? Mm -hmm. What's the best way to repair it through God? Or just in general? One, if you break a relationship of trust with another person, you have to have the courage to apologize and acknowledge that you broke that trust. That's a way to repair trust with other people because when people see that you have the bravery to, 
to admit your fault. People learn to say, to admire that. And admiring that builds trust. Right. In fact, it, it takes a lot of bravery, a lot of bravery to admit that you did something wrong. Because that's the hardest thing for most people is to be brave enough. But that type of bravery earns people's admiration. And the same thing with God. Is God is the most forgiving, the most merciful. God forgives all as long as you own up to your mistake. You know, if people that just sweep their mistakes under the rug and just take God for granted and just expect God to, to forgive it, well, that's not respectful towards God. I mean, it's like, why should you expect God to respect you if you don't respect God? But people who own up to their fault and talk to God and say, God, yeah, I, I made a mistake and I'm admitting my mistake and I am promising you, God, that I'm going to do my best not to repeat this mistake again. Yeah. God forgives. You know, God is not out to get us. Actually... The Prophet Muhammad taught that the that God loves a sinner who repents. Yeah. Someone who admits their fault and repents, that actually makes God that builds a relationship with God. That makes God love them. Yeah. Because they they have courage and that courage is to be admired. Yeah. Okay. Uh oh, we should talk about I wanted to know more about like I know you said there were some gospels that were rejected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, there are a lot of gospels that were rejected. Like the like um in this is in the Bible. You see when after Jesus died there were a lot of gospels that appeared in the first hundred years yeah. well actually I mean about 200 years after Jesus and some of the gospels like the gospel of Anak the gospel yeah. of Barnabas the gospel of James the, the, and these gospels are really fascinating uh, there's also something called the Gnostic gospels yeah. They're very fascinating because if you read them, they they often tell things. They say a story that is very different than the gospels that the church ended up accepting, like, and and it's very hard to generalize because they, you know, they they tell some of them, you know, like have direct contradictions with the Bible. Some of them. Um, present a different point of view it, it just uh, and about 300 years after Jesus died what formed as the church the church that that was supposed to receive the Holy Ghost um, from Jesus yeah. um, <clears throat> that church under the 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 auspices of the government at the time held a number of councils and in these councils the members of the church picked the gospels that ended up being the bible and said well these are the canonical gospels and they rejected everything else now the decision to reject so many other gospels was partly theological but also to a great deal political Maybe. Like, a lot of these Gospels undermined the authority of the Church. Yeah. And the Church wanted to be the only authority to speak on behalf of Jesus. And no one else gets to speak on behalf of Jesus. Yeah. Um, but, you know, a lot of them are published. And I can, like, ref I can show you, or I can refer you to a lot of books that are really interesting. Some of them are not even, like, 
like you know advanced books some of them someone like at your age can read them yeah um that tells you what these other gospels were and how they differed and you know some of them are really fascinating like i i find the gospel of enoch really interesting because it it talks about you know it some it sounds like it's even talking about aliens from outer space quite frankly yeah. i mean it, it sounds like you know like there were watchers and they come and they and they interact with human beings and so on um some of them like the gospel of barnabas um says that there's a prophet coming after jesus and that's yeah. going to be the final prophet um so you know some of them speak about jesus like gospel of james you know that jesus is not divine and was never intended to be thought of as divine yeah some of them even say that jesus was never crucified i mean it mm. it blows your mind and it's um and what, the other thing is a lot of people don't know that the Gospels that the Catholic Church accepts are different from the Gospels that the Orthodox accepts, or Orthodox Church, and are oh. different from the Gospels that the Protestant Church accepts. Oh, so there's just entire, entire parts of the Bible that are just different? Yeah, it's not all the Bible, but like the Protestants accept certain Gospels that the Catholic Church don't accept. And the Catholic yeah. Church accepts certain Gospels that the Protestants don't accept. Yeah. So, you, you know, it's, it's, it's like people say, and that's why it's always tricky, because when people say Christianity, my question is always, well, which Christianity? Like, what, which version of Christianity do you and you know it's the fact that the church settled centuries ago decided that paul's christianity what is known as pauline christianity yeah was the right christianity you know is a very curious decision because why i mean why pauline christianity why not james well, James yeah. was supposed to be far more important authority. At least James lived and interacted with Jesus, but Paul never met Jesus. Yeah. But you know that that's the way it is. It's just the way history developed, and and the Roman Empire played a huge role. Yeah, with, in, um, in that decision. What's his name? Constantine. Constantine? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, yeah. I mean, Const Constantine. Well, came from a pagan background and he understood pagan mythology and pagan mythology always thought of God as having several heads. Yeah. They didn't believe in a God with one head. And so Paul Pauline Christianity for Constantine made a lot of sense because it was a God, you know, three in one, like yeah. very much like Roman gods and ancient Egyptian gods. And but that's the way, you know that's the way it developed and oh you know history is funny because history often um, you know we we live in we history often gives us curveballs and when you look back and you say well could it could it have been different yes it could have been very different yeah. why did it develop that way. Often there's just circumstances in history that makes human beings take one direction or another direction. And the best thing to do with history is to learn from it and learn the lessons of the mistakes done in the past and possibly what we can learn from these mistakes. You know, that's that's why history is there. Yeah. Is it, I noticed, I don't know who said it, but, like, history is written by the victors, right? Well, that's always the case. I mean, and that's why, like, when you, if you're a good historian and you're a good mm -hmm. scholar, you always try to go and find the sources of the people that didn't win. Yeah, because, I mean, right, Christianity was made, 
very popular by the Romans. Mm -hmm. The Romans were the most powerful at that time. They were the power. They were. They were the, I mean, they were yeah. like the U.S. now. They they were the super empire. Yeah. So there could have been an entire different Christianity that wasn't popular at the Romans' yeah. time. I mean, and the fact, the thing is that a lot of the people, the the Christians that were not, they didn't agree with the Roman Empire. What they did was that they went and and escaped and lived in caves yeah. in various different parts, uh, especially in the Middle East and especially like a place like Egypt. And they lived in caves and they preserved the manuscripts that the Romans destroyed. The Romans yeah. were burning everything that didn't agree with them. And they hid these manuscripts in caves. And these are the manuscripts that today we you know, we found, and when we yeah. read, we discovered, okay, here are the dissenters, the people that basically ran, escaped in order to avoid persecution. And it's very interesting. I mean, like, they, a, a lot of people didn't, the way that they, they understood Jesus was that Jesus basically was a Messiah about the end of times, that yeah. Jesus believed that the end of times were coming not hundreds of years later yeah. but were coming like right after his death yeah no and because i remember i don't know if it's in the bible but it said somewhere like there's gonna be three antichrists yeah and then the world's gonna end and but the 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 a lot of the gnostics believe that you know basically the end of times were at their time yeah and they were waiting for the end of times. And and this thing about like Jesus being the savior and uh, the Antichrist will come centuries later and so on developed much later. I mean it yeah. was it was like an idea that that took centuries to develop. But I mean it's the most um the thing that you know Christianity, like all other religions and all diff different points of view, you have you have to respect people's beliefs. You can disagree with them, but you you respect their beliefs, and you you say you know I honor your right to believe whatever you want, mm -hmm. and as long as you honor my right to believe in what I want, yeah. and I respect you, in turn you have to respect me. I disagree with you, but I disagree with respect. And, you know, it's, we, we, it, it's, it, it, so all of, you know, we, we understand when you're interested in knowledge, you read knowledge to understand the truth as <clears throat> much as you can. Yeah. But at the same time, you have to understand, like, pe people's beliefs are sometimes, <coughs> like, a lot of people, the reason they believe in something is because that's what they were raised with. And they're really, they're going to believe in whatever they want to believe, regardless of what yeah. the facts are. You know? And so, life has taught me that, you know, it, There are a lot of people that just believe in something because it makes them comfortable. Yeah. I remember you were saying, because we were talking about this in the car ride home, but you were saying, like, even if, uh, like, all of these facts came out and people actually read the Bible and all the contradictions, that a lot of people wouldn't change just because yeah. it's... I mean, you know, so someone made, and it's actually really good, someone made the comment, and it's really true, if you take the Gospels that are in the Bible right now, yeah. And instead of reading them one after the other, then what you do is that you, you lay them out, like you put Luke, you put Matthew, you put, um, you know, um, um, Mark, Mark yeah. and, and, um, John. and John and yeah. so on, and you lay them side by side, and you read passage by passage about the story of Jesus. Yeah. What you'll discover is like you read paragraph here and then a paragraph here and a paragraph here and a paragraph here. What you discover is immediately is that they're inconsistent. Yeah. Like they, none of the 
four gospels actually agree with each other. Right. So you know they'll t one gospel will tell you you know Jesus went up the mountain, and then he, he went to his disciples and woke them up. Another gospel will tell you no, it wasn't a mountain; it was a bunch of trees. Another gospel will tell you no, Jesus didn't go wake up his disciples at all because they went asleep out. You know, so it's like the disagree the inconsistencies are there and they're plain for everyone to see. Yes. It's not like all you have to do is just put in a little effort to read the Gospels and compare them. But, you know, a lot of Christians notice this and they say, well, it doesn't really matter because what's important is the total message. Yeah. But, of course, then if the details don't matter, then how could be all how could all the gospels be sacred? Because if they're if they're from God, yeah. God wouldn't be inconsistent. God would know what happened, right? God yeah. wouldn't get the story wrong. You know, or have different versions of the story. But then they'd say, "Oh well, you know, no, no, don't don't pay attention to the details. No one expects." You know, God didn't write the Gospels with these writers of the Gospels. And the most important thing is that they told us the basic, like the the thrust of the story, the basic bottom line of the story. Right. But then, you know, if if the details don't matter, and Jesus didn't say he's God, and the Trinity is not in any of the Gospels, none of yeah. the Gospels said there is a Trinity, and none of the Gospels, Jesus claims to be God. And Jesus himself calls himself Son of Man. And then when Jesus says, I'm so, uses the expression Son of God, we know that the Bible throughout, like Moses was the Son of God. Yeah. Solomon was the Son of God. So on what basis are you building the claim of the Trinity and the whole atonement theme and the whole, you know, dying for the sins of human beings theme. Well, the, then you go back to, well, these are the teachings of the fathers of the church. Yeah. The fathers of the church said so. And then we get into this, okay, well, you know, they, they believe that the fathers of the church were guided by the Holy Spirit yeah. but or the Holy Ghost. But then, you know, we get into, well... Okay, the, the, if the Bible doesn't say so, and what is the proof that they had the Holy Ghost in them? I right. mean, you know, who were these men? And the Holy Ghost were in all of these men, and all of these men, you know, met in several councils, and they disagreed with each other. So how could the Holy Ghost be in all of them, but then they have these disagreements, and some of them were persecuted, and so I'm supposed to believe that the ones who were allied with the Roman Empire had the Holy Ghost in them, and the ones that were opposed to what the Roman Empire wanted didn't have the Holy Ghost in them. Yeah. You know, it gets very messy. And, and that's why it just like... What, what I really don't understand is that when someone who was not born Christian... Yeah. tries to learn Christianity and then becomes Christian, that for me is very difficult to, for me to understand. Yeah, Because it's like, okay, on what basis? And often then you get something like, oh, well, I just experienced the Holy Ghost. Well, what are you going to tell them? I mean, it's like someone that says, I have a dream. I had a dream. And in the dream, Jesus appeared to me or the Prophet Muhammad appeared to me or Moses appeared to me. And they told me this and this and that. Well, then it's just their experience. And yeah. you're going to say, okay, well, you know, that's your own personal thing. And, I, and if they're a respectable human being, say, you know, I respect you for what you believe and you just leave it at that. Because yeah. there, there's, you know, these very personal, private experiences, you can't, you can't interrogate them, you know? They're very private and very yeah. personal. And they belong to the person that experienced them. And you just pray that they're not from, you just pray for their sake. 
right. that they didn't come from the devil, that they came from somewhere like good. Yeah. Because the devil can trip us and can pretend that yeah. you know the devil can appear in 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 a in a way that tricks you. The only the only guarantee you have is to be a, a good of a human being as you can. And that's why she takes us back to the topic of lying because like my experience of life is one way to make yourself immune against the devil is not to lie. Yeah. I don't know why, but lying it's like opens up portals for demons to come in through. And and like even the people that get possessed by demons yeah. in every case I've seen the person that got possessed was a liar. Yeah. That person has lied in their life so many times. And often a lot of people like tell me, well, why is this person possessed or not? And that person isn't possessed. In my experience, the one thing that is consistent about every person that I've known that got possessed or got demonic oppression is lying. Yeah. Is that they were liars. It's amazing. It really is. Okay, I think there's two more questions I have. Okay. Uh, okay, yeah, the first one was, have any prophets, like, directly contradicted each other? Or, like, contradicted Jesus' teachings? Well... Before or after? Well, yeah, I mean, if you read the Old Testament... Yeah. The amazing thing about the Old Testament is that you know, the first commandment that Moses taught is that there is one God and there's no partners to God. Yeah. So, and then if you read the Old Testament, all the prophets of the Old Testament, all the prophets, you know, Noah, Moses, Solomon, David, all of them insisted that there's one God and this God is, you know, eternal, all powerful, immutable. Now, none of them said anything about Trinity or Son of God or Holy Ghost or anything like that. So, I mean, that is a contradiction because, mm -hmm. but of course now, you know, big question is, well, even the, the you know, Luke and Matt and Matthew and John and so on, they don't, really explicitly say the Trinity either, but there are parts of them, like, especially in, like, John and Paul and one passage in Matthew that sort of you, that can be read to imply the idea of the Trinity. Of course, there, there's a historical problem is that a lot of them in the early versions of Matthew that mention that, that passage doesn't exist, so it yeah. was added very late. But anyway... For a Christian, they would have to admit that the prophets of the Old Testament don't are not. Let's put it this way: it, it it would be very easy to make the case that the prophets of the Old Testament contradict the teachings yes. of the entire church. Um, in, especially in the Quran. All the prophets, when the Quran talks about the prophets, all the prophets have one message. None of them contradict each other. They're, they're, all the prophets are sent with the same basic message in the Quran. Yeah. And that's one big difference between the Bible and the Quran. The Bible has a lot of stories about the prophets that the Quran doesn't agree with. Like, you know, stories... Um, like, especially, like, with stories about Solomon and David, like, you know, Solomon married a thousand women yeah. in, in the Bible. Well, in the Quran, or, or a hundred women. In the, in the Quran, it doesn't agree with that, yeah. you know. So, but if you read the story of the prophets in the Quran, you'd find that basically it's the same God, and God is sending one prophet after another to tell people the same message 
and people keep, you know, they, they get it when the prophet is alive, but then yeah. when the prophet dies, people start twisting it. Yeah. And so God sends another prophet, and God sends another, and, and, and there's no difference between the messages of the prophets in mm -hmm. the Quran. Okay. Yeah, okay, and then, this isn't really a question, but have you heard of that story where someone got possessed? And it said, like, uh, people who've done, like, really bad things in history, like Hitler and, like, um, who's that guy? I don't know. Just a bunch of really bad people started possessing this person, and they started, uh, like, talking trash about each other. No, I didn't hear no. that. Search it up, because it's funny, because it's like, um, someone said, like, Hitler is not very big in hell. Yeah, I don't know. I, anyway, I, I, so yeah. you know, I have, I can connect this. So no, I mean, I, I'll tell you, I'm, I, I mean, like the, the human beings when they die. Yeah. I don't believe that a human be a human spirit can possess someone. Yeah. I I, I just that because when a human spirit dies. It's received by God, and it's either goes to a blessed place, yeah. a, 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 or it goes to hell, and and I don't believe that, you know, that idea that like Hitler or you know because you have these oh you know I, I someone says I'm possessed with the, uh, it used to be in the old days like uh, more more popular say you know I'm possessed by the soul of Dracula. Yeah. You know, because the, the uh, uh, Dracul, who, who was a very bloody human being, who you know loved to torture human people, and I, I think that's nonsense. I mean, so yeah. when someone says, "Oh, I'm possessed by the soul of Hitler," no, you might be possessed by a demon who's pretending to be Hitler, yeah. but you're not. You're definitely not possessed by the soul of Hitler. Okay. okay, so the way I'm connecting this, I know. I think I've heard you say before. There's different levels of heaven. Yeah. Yeah. So, are there different levels of hell? There are. Yeah. I mean, that's a that's a big topic. But you know, if you think about it, like even in human prisons, yeah, there are you know serial killers that we put them in maximum security prison yeah. and the worst type of prison, and there are people that you know might have gone to prison because. They stole something. Yes, yeah, you know, but shoplifted or, or uh, hurt someone by accident in a negligent case, yeah. in a case of negligence, and we we don't put them in the worst type of prisons. And I think that's justice. I mean, yeah. it, it, not all evil is the same. And because God is just, how badly you get punished depends on the level of your sins, and. Mm -hmm the levels of your sins are determined in turn by how badly you hurt other human beings and how many human beings have hurt. So you know, when I think of like these like rulers like Hitler or Stalin or, or like these dictators like the dictator in Egypt, Sisi, or the dictator yeah. in Saudi Arabia, I mean, can you imagine how many people they hurt? I mean, how many people they imprisoned, how many people they tortured, how many people they killed? They're going to be a, in the worst level of hell, yeah, you know, uh, and you know, one of the it's like it's always to remember that the worst sin of all is to kill someone to terminate human life. Yeah, that's the worst sin of all. And in the Quran, it says, "Whoever kills a single human being, it's as if they killed all of humanity," because God, you know, now there are. But not any of the levels of hell are not yeah. good, you know. So it's like, I, I always pray to God, please, you know, forgive all my sins, the sins that I know about and the sins that I might have forgotten about, and please don't let me visit any level of hell because I don't want to go, I don't want to go there. I don't want to even yeah. see it. You know, it, it just it's scary enough as it is. Yeah, and I know, I don't know if you said this, but, like, you can serve an amount of time in hell. 
and then you'll be forgiven. Yeah, I mean, it, it depends. It's like you pay your bill, basically. Yeah. Hell is a way where God, you know, of course, if you pay your bill, God is very really forgiving, and God gets no pleasure. I, I mean, the reason God has punishment is for justice, so that people know that there's going to be justice, and that, uh, you know, someone doesn't kill your mother or kill your, your, your son, and then you say, oh, well, there's no justice. No, there is going to be justice. But at the same time, the, you know, God doesn't enjoy punishing us. And so yeah. what, if once you pay up your, your sins, you pay your bill, you'll be forgiven. Now, where do you go? Do you, you know, you, it's not likely that you're going to go to the highest level of heaven yeah. from hell, but, you know, at least you're, you know, you'll be released from hell and spend whatever existence is left for you, depending on what, you know, God decides, at least in a, in, you know, in whatever, in God's grace. Yeah. And that's good enough. I mean, we, we just don't know, we, we're talking about a world that we haven't experienced. Now, some people who are get very, very close to God, like Sufi mystics, yeah. they can get so close to God that they get a glimpse of the hereafter while they're still alive. But that, that they're at a very high level. <coughs> You know, they they worship God so much that, and they become like companions of God, that they start seeing the world after in this life. Yeah. But that that's like a very high status. That's very hard to achieve. Yeah. Are you close to that? No, you... Don't ask me that. <laughs> yeah. No. I just, I, I just, my, my, my attitude towards God is one of just very, uh, of humility, great humility. It's like, I, I just want God, I just want to get closer and closer to God, and I want to love God and for God to love me, and for, to be as, you know, it's like a relationship that I work at. I can't take God for granted because God doesn't take me for granted. And like all relationships, you know, you have to work at it. You have to spend time. It's like, you know, having friends. If you don't talk to a friend for a long time and you don't interact with them, you know, your friendship gets cold. And and then you reconnect. And it's like, okay, why, why did we waste all this time not being close to each other? Well, same thing with God. If you don't invest the time, your relationship gets cold. Yeah. And then when you invest the time, you you get closer and closer and closer. And that's what I that's what I strive for, and that's what you should strive for. Because you, as you get older, especially the older you get, the more you realize, okay, well, you know what? Um, time passes so fast, and I don't know when I'm going to die. And I don't, you know, it's really silly not to invest for the life hereafter because it's going to come. You know, it's just a matter of, it's like every day you live is a day spent from your, you know, your credit on this earth. And so then you, you really, and the closer you get to God, the happier you get and the more comfort you feel. And then, and it's the same way, like, you know, if the demonics fills you with fear and anxiety and anger and restlessness, and the divine fills you with peace and happiness and forgiveness, you know, you forgive people and you're, you're not angry at people. And that's a beautiful state to be in. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, inshallah, next time, I want to start telling you about the story of the Prophet Muhammad. Yeah. Because I think, one, it's a very important story to know, but it, it's, um, you know, it's a, a, lot of, a, lot, a lot of Muslims, especially Muslims who are growing up, who grow up here, they never get the opportunity to learn who the Prophet Muhammad was. 
and you know from the time he was an orphan and growing up in Mecca yeah. and, and the story of his mother and father and his grand and his uncles and his grandfather so inshallah next time we'll start we'll okay. talk about the story right, okay cool. story time yeah. Yeah. story time inshallah okay alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah.